like my colleague Mar, I want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to thank the Humanities Initiative for their support, um, intellectual, institutional, and emotional, uh, throughout this year and for this conference. Um, and of course, thank you to Professor Schertzinger for uh, acquiescing to my uh, coercion to speak to us today at this conference. Um, I'm going to give you just a short introduction on this panel, and then I'll introduce both Professor Schertzinger and our two respondents, and then we'll just move on to the panel. Uh, the humanities and globalism has become a central concern in the academy at least since the 60s. Though even in the midst of World War II, one finds scholars in the humanities deliberating on the usefulness of these disciplines and these canons for instrumental uses, i.e., how can the humanities contribute materially to the war effort? With the advent of globalization and cosmopolitanism, discourse on the humanities has centered on canons, east, west, and in between, with the usefulness of the humanities becoming central in determining not only the validity of the various canons, but also the possibility of a new canon for a new world. And this was the inception originally for this, for this panel, how the humanities as a set of disciplines and a set of canons uh, interact with what are in fact other, uh, other nations, other humanities, other disciplines, other canons. However, in this panel, we are examining instead the invisible canons the technologies and materialities that, creates, that create canons which escape our notice. The piano and its translation to digital media here, MIDI, M-I-D-I, the only programming language available to translate music into digital uh, formats, is one such means to question the humanities in our globalized world. So let me introduce you to our speaker, Professor Martin Scherzinger. Um, he teaches, he's an associate professor at the Department of Media, Culture, and Communic Communication. Um, and though his expertise, his interests, and his work ranges wildly, um, to include mathematics, uh, in this talk uh, he will be drawing on his expertise in minimalist composition, African music technologies, and digital media. Uh, as respondents, we have Professor Kevin Velez from Columbia, who teaches at the uh, Department of Music and African American Studies, um, and recently arrived at the department, right? Um, he was uh, previous to that at the University of California at Merced, and holds his PhD uh, from UC Santa Cruz in History of Consciousness, which I think is one of the most fabulous programs in the country. Um, his first book, entitled Birds of Fire, Jazz, Rock, Funk, and the Creation of Fus uh, Fusion from Duke University Press, came out recently and is a study of fusion. So the, the interaction between these different forms of music, which include jazz, rock, and funk, uh, here in the 1970s. Uh, he has many, many articles, which I will not cite, um, uh, but we are very lucky to have him, and thank you for coming. And our second respondent is Jane Tylus, who, uh, as you all know, is the director of the Humanities Initiative and is a professor here at the Department of Italian um, and Comparative Literature. Yes. Uh, Jane is an expert on many facets of the Renaissance and uh, is recently working on a book that promises to be absolutely fascinating on leading Siena. So, trying to get a sense of um, this place and its uh, location in multiple imaginaries and multiple discourses and multiple texts and multiple materialities. So we are all looking forward to it. Hopefully it'll come out soon. Uh, this is just uh, her current work. She has many other publications, which I invite you to, uh, to discover on her website. If I list them here, we'll be here uh, far too long. Uh, so without further ado, Welcome to our presenter and respondents, and thank you for coming.
initiative uh, for their um, incredible um, uh, sort of intellectual uh, contributions this year, but also for making things really tangible possible. And this is a, an amateur activity for me, being an artist, uh, unfortunately, to uh, and to consider this is a sort of symptom of our times. Um, and so it's uh, a parallel line. And I'm glad to have been given some uh, sort of uh, support uh, in doing that. Um, Okay, so the title of the talk is going to be um, of platonic objects and their mesmers, but it's really just a description about what we think we're doing in this work and what we hope uh, to be doing. And I'm going to end the talk with a kind of a, a modulation into um, an area that I think will intersect uh, quite powerfully with what we heard in the previous um, talk, and I hope um, uh, ignites some discussion. So this uh, uh, piece, uh, the typewriter opera, um, explores the piano as an archetypal mechanical inscription technology. Um, most obviously the piece is uh, in some ways a musical composition uh, deploying what I might describe as an under-harmonized basso da capo of a theme, a keyboard theme written in 1710 uh, by, um, uh, by Handel uh, the year after the piano was invented by um, Cristofori, at least the standardized piano we understand it here. It's been reconceptualized uh, as a, a, a piece for, uh, for four hands. Um, of course, at the other end, bookended is the figure of Brahms, um, Johannes Brahms, uh, who perhaps brings the sort of um, classical era of the piano, and by classical I don't mean a music stylistic thing, but just when it had its heyday, when it was the central referent for Western music, um, uh, uh, probably brought that to a close. Um, after Brahms, people, uh, uh, composers, or the Western sort of uh, trajectory uh, development um, evolution in its self-described way, moves in new directions. Um, so it's bookended more or less uh, stylistically by Handel on the one hand and Brahms on the other, the life of the piano. Um, and of course, the, the piece has those tensions in it. There's the Baroque sort of cyclic variation form, uh, sort of having to cohabit a more developmental a vector that uh, characterizes romantic music, and that is perhaps its dialectical kind of to and fro and opens up through circling a certain kind of, um, uh, 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 yeah, a dialectical to and fro. It's a sort of circularity but inflected difference or something like that. Um, and then it culminates in the end with a slight push into something that's not quite Brahmsian anymore. It also begins with something slightly under harmonized, not quite yet Handel and then a little bit beyond Brahms, but like otherwise it's pretty handcuffed um, in that style, like stylistic universe. Um, okay, so uh, at stake, however, is the, uh, is the uh, piano as an ontological object. So despite the many updates during the past 300 years, it is surprising to observe how similar Christofori's 1709 invention is to the modern piano today. But more surprising is the capacious stability of its interface design in technologies that are no longer controlled to the task of integrating these equidistant mechanical components with the human sensory, cognitive, and motor apparatus. Uh, so the tactility of the digiti extending from the human hand and so on. So it is no longer situated, if you like, at the crossroads of techniques and flesh. The once productive melange of key, code, signal, hammer, hand, finger, and ear um, it, Musical time today is nonetheless still held in the arms of its code. Okay, so very quickly, the piano as a kind of template uh, has become the standard design for representing music in software today. So from the pitch lattices that ground current popular music to the sound design designs of commercial ambience, from the programs underwriting MIDI, audio beeps, alarms, recorded voices and ringtones, to software applications for iPhones and iPads that enable users to create compositions of their own, boom, um, electro and so on and so forth. Auditory experience today is increasingly marked by a subset of discrete tones that fit on a standard modular grid, standardized modular grid. So MIDI, for example, is an integral, an integral component of most digital workstations today. The need for standardization if you want interoperability. I mean, that's the, in, a, in a sort of summary version. So the piano, piano's coded data format, if you like, has become immortalized as a kind of archetypical digital representation scheme uh, for music in our times, and hence a platonic object. The piano, however, construes music on the model of a zoetrope, a cylindrical device invented by Ting Fan in China around 180 AD. The 
spinning zoetrope made an illusion of motion out of a quick succession of static pictures. It was once known as the wheel of life and then as the wheel of the devil. The device exploited the threshold where the eye could no longer distinguish increments of discrete pointer from a continuum. In the 19th century, the British mathematician William Homer invented the modern zoetrope, which he named Dedalum, after the mythological figure of Dedalus, a clever artisan whose designs were said to have been touched by the divine. Dedalus devised the wooden cow that visually tricked Poseidon's white bull to consummate a cursed zoophilic act with Pasiphae, the king of Minos. The offspring of this union between animal and human, or more precisely the union between animal and exoskeletal prosthesis, was the Minotaur, a monstrous flesh-eating creature, later imprisoned in the labyrinth of Crete. The labyrinth, another cunning invention of Daedalus, was the perfect technological solution to the problem created by his exoskeletal device. Its circuit was so rigorously designed to deceive the man bull's eye, in numeres errore vias, that the inventor himself barely escaped the logic of the, the grasp of its logic. And so the theory goes, the maestro of the mirage threaded newer media from the cloth of older media, ever tressing the calculus toward an auto-generative asymptote. The piano is of this technological species, an instrument of magical sensory illusion. Like a zoetrope, it animates lines by way of stop motion, key to code, blow by hammer blow. Its lines of flight are crisscrossed, a pixelated plasticity born of permutations gridded to multiple parallel keys. It is a peculiarity of history that music making in the high period of the piano was underwritten by an aesthetics of temporal transformation and transience. Fluidity and flow, motion, mutability, expression and curvature, morphosis and wave, indivisible time, diagonal and empty territorialization. Because in truth, the winged arrows of music's sonotropic metaphysics were mesmerized by a standardized succession of detached filmic data. The polyphonic flow of the piano was, more accurately, the flow of full stops, a refusal of time. The finger dance on its gridded black and white series was stringing along the ear in beads of time, undertaking a music that was without music. Our perception is quick to identify already known order from rapid sequences of still frames. We see things in other things. We hear signals in sliced noise. We finish sentences for one another. Like oracles of predictive text, our senses send envoys into the future to seek out plausible form from the past. Our eyes and ears are good at bending the facts, finding the sweet space and spot that gives shape and face to fragments and dots, and that gives contour and continuity to pitch and functor. In pianism, the romantic virtuoso performs a stunt founded on me mechanical dexterity a stunt for the senses. Set to work on the chromatic interface, his finger dance synchronizes key to tone type in tessellations that conjure an anamorphic ear. The virtuoso, the virtuoso is the piano's charismatic Mesmer. Like Daedalus, the 18th century celebrity physician Franz Mesmer used illusionism to assist young pianists, including Mozart, in the art of animal magnetism. The pianist then subtends time by way of finger pointing, hammering out the details that will trick the ear into hearing lines and operatic curves. So this work, the typewriter opera, is on the one hand utterly seduced by the charisma of its coded mesmers, but on the other hand it recoils from the abstract phylum of ideas that lock in to a subset of musical practice today. The piece backwinds to the genealogical origins of the piano. It returns to the crossroads, with body made machine to recover a site where it may not have happened, if only to ponder the road not taken. The qualitative difference between the five fingers, from the binary phalanges of the pollex or the thumb to the ternary ones of the digitus, digitus minimus manus, fused with a quantitative equality of the keyboard's parallel components. A panoply of numerical systems interact within this nexus. The pentadactyl hand, with its mathematically impractical but some say biomechanically preferable decimal schema, touches down upon the composite dozenalism of the piano's chromatic aggregate. Music's rhythmic notation segments time with the radix of high as high as bass 32, 
and standard pitch notation inflects a duodecimal system with a diatonic septal one. In other words, Western music generally separates a pentatonic complement, the black hand of the piano, to single out seven notes for special time or attention. It might be worth pointing out that the chromatic aggregate recapitulates the modulo 12 of daily clock time, while the pattern of whole and half tones of the diatonic subset recapitulates the pattern of the seven long and five short months governing annual time. In the pianistic interface, these modular and modular wheels of time cycle like composite zoetropes within other wheels. A little bit about the actual way the movie unfolds. By bringing the piano performance under the one-eyed gaze of a barely blinking camera, two standard modes of perception are made to confront one another, the ear versus the eye. The camera isolates the keyboard portion of the two Steinways, drawing attention only to the pianistic interface and its types of data entry as such, thereby leaving in view only organs without their body. The piece starts with a solo rendition of a simple theme set to a coherent image sound relation. As the variations unfold, however, elements in the inherent in the interface itself seem to change their relation to the ear and the eye. It is as if non-diegetic apparitions emerge from absolute diegesis. Slight shifts in the mechanism that link finger action and sounding form seem to turn up on the scene. In piano performance, the hand is not a complete inmate to its semiotic task. Free fingers float and dangle oddly amidst those conscripted to actually depressing keys at any given time. Furthermore, the hand's grandest gestures, rapid leaps across the keyboard that take place in the blink of an eye, or in reality tracing lines of silence as the pianist shifts from one hand position to another. The visual line is an inside-out image of the sonic line that it writes. There's a lot more here, but I'm going to skip. Um, I mean, for example, the vertigo of the eye looking at the keyboard um, upside down as if there were an orientation that were not upside down is an interesting uh, fact. But the most striking of the audio, uh, fallout of the audiovisual scene for me occurs in the middle ground passages when under the bright light of the literal gaze, the music seems to detach from its image in flickering fits and starts. In these passage, passages, the literal unocular eye seems to become bifurcated. The music appears to go faster or slower uh, than the film, or simply to lift off as if the ear were constantly dropping the ball of the eye, or as if the music's past was disappearing ahead of itself. The way the image marks time, one might say, is different to the way sound does so. The confusion of these moments, however, also contain, contains the seeds of their clarification. Because mimetic congruence falters. What you see is not quite what you get. A seeming disconnect appears between the handfuls of discrete quanta and the resulting sonic reference. Ear-eye disparities bring sense to the fantastic contingency of typing for sound on a coded template. Musical instruments with different, differently designed material interfaces no less enveloped in their digitoria. Animate systems and semiotics at work in their sounding boards otherwise. Sometimes even actively bring into consideration what the template itself is deaf and blind to. In this instrument, the matepe, uh, uh, an instrument from the northern part of Zimbabwe uh, or the eastern part of Mozambique or southern part of Zambia. Here, here too, in this instrument, matepe, we find a coded key system. In this case, a heptatonic pitch series intersecting a duodecimally organized time field, and so on. But here the low notes cluster toward the middle of the instrument, with higher notes fanning outward to facilitate the near-symmetrical relation between two human hands. It's a kind of playing technology that actually emphasizes the left hand thumb, reversing the psychology of motor asymmetry in the hands. It's a different education, if you like, of bodily comportment. The pattern of keys and the different use of the hands, fingers in performance pro proffers a powerful set of different efficiencies and functionalities, which I won't pursue here. But there is one striking difference between the matepe and the piano that is worth mentioning, namely the division of labor between performers. Traditionally played in pairs, just like the pianists you saw, although it's not traditional in the West, one player interlocks within the spaces of the other, so it's a very tightly wrought chain. The sort of rule of thumb when you're playing on tape, you may never touch, as it were, the sounds made by another player. So you're absolutely interlocked throughout. This is 
this kind of woven arrangement produces a particular kind of what I call ratchet wheel aleatorics. Again, no less digital, no, no less digital than anything we find here on the piano. And this issues figures of what one can only call of uh, call asynchronous sound or ventriloquized sound. Not only is the motor image of the striking fingers radically delinked from the acoustic image that comes to ear, but musical lines issue forth a kind of thrown voice. The Matepe then writes sound by throwing lines of unplayed material, a parallel poly polyphony that escapes the supervision of its makers. This is musical xenogenesis. It's the appearance of a sound form pertaining to foreign matter. It's like a magic typewriter. The interface design of the Matepe scrambles its given codes into a higher order coherence. The result is a cryptographic sublime, as if visited on, uh, as if visited upon by something unguessed at. It is music to invoke ancestral spirits. It should be clear that the, the, the typewriter opera does not inveigh against music construed as an established system of coded relationships. Perhaps reality today can no longer not be conceived as a network of fast typists. As if the indivisible time of virtual phenomena, from noisy curvature to grains in voices, were not themselves ingrained and systematically deployed as sites of great deception and big lies, even. Instead, it seeks to draw attention to the piano's coalescent ontology by casting human shadows back onto the platonic object. The piano as a formal music maker that enjoys a world monopoly, even and especially in its immaterial incarnation. The enduring digital interface of the piano subtends a subset for music and it has silently amplified a hypothesis into reality, transforming by repetition a form into fact. It is now locked in. It is not interlocked. I'm just going to finish at this point with one remark uh, sort of off the cuff because it comes to mind. Um, Alexander Galloway has just written a book called The Interface Effect. He's a colleague of mine. And what he notices in, these, in software design is that there's nothing soft about software, that software is kind of hard. And in fact, um, sort of scripts very uh, absolutely and in great detail uh, to the infinite degree uh, what constitutes the instructions for the machine. So he gives examples, for example, from uh, games like uh, World of Warcraft where uh, black stereotypes um, need to be scripted very precisely, uh, you know, with uh, a bigger lips and a Jamaican accent and a certain attitude and so on and so forth. Um, it sort of perfects the design. And of course, what we do when we play games is think these are just virtual and playful and so on and so forth. But he's arguing that it dabbles much more, uh, not in the virtual, but in, uh, in a sense, in the absolute. And I think ending with that might be a way of rethinking representational schema as they become reincarnated in code uh, which are more or less uh, invisible to most of us um, uh, and uh, uh, often, uh, uh, and here's the final point I'd make, uh, sort of uh, stored for us in clouds um, that uh, are uh, you know, infrastructurally determined incremental spaces called infrastructure that are increasingly proprietary and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I'll just leave you with that thought uh, in closing. Thank you.
but where perhaps we might overlap, I think, is, is what I see as Martin's great love for piano, uh, which I share, as he provokes us to think in stimulating ways about its birth and maybe its death. Uh, only someone who loves the piano as an instrument will know, as, as Martin does, quote, the grand gesture of the hand in its rapid leaps across the keyboard that take place in the blink of an eye. A gesture that is really tracing lines of silence as the pianist shifts from hand position to hand position away from the keys. In moments such as this, the exquisite connection of craft and theory, I think, is stunning, confirming what we see in the ten books of architecture by Vitruvius, who wrote in first century BCE Rome, uh, and said this, the arts are composed of two things, craftsmanship and theory. My own decision at age 17 not to pursue conservatory studies in piano was largely because of my inability, uh, my faltering, I guess you could say, to see in craft a process of thought. A faltering, in this case, of the imagination, and my inability to, to see how the hand could be connected to the mind. But of course, as Richard Sennett has put it in his own work called The Craftsman, and he cites Kant here, the hand is the window onto the mind, and Sennett goes on. Science has sought to show how the varied motions of the hands plus the hand's varied ways of gripping and the sense of touch affect how we think. And this is what I think now, in a brief series of random reflections inspired by Martin's movie, uh, by his music and by his remarks about the piano and its place in postmodern life. So I just have four brief little thoughts which are, again, more rips than uh, substantial uh, talk. Um, first of all, uh, I want to invoke it by just saying okay, it's post standard one of the most wrenching sites in the West Village where I live, right after the hurricane, were the pianos started showing up on the sidewalks near the Hudson River. Uh, pianos mainly coming from the West Bend housing apartments. Mostly they were uprights, but one day a baby grand appeared uh, next to uh, the sodden, pages the sodden mattresses and couches and bookcases and books. It was sad, of course, to see the furniture and sadder still to look inside the apartments uh, to see, you know, water on the ground and the pumps furiously working 24 hours a day. But to see pianos was just something else. Since the late 19th century, when the piano was the sign that you had arrived as a bourgeois family, when every child of well-to-do families took piano lessons, when the piano came to occupy the center of the living room and to define a middle-class home as much as in the heart, in the days before radio, television, computers, the piano was the gathering place that defines not so much a child's burgeoning musical talent as the notion at its best, a place where song, morality, community converged, as someone might even pick out with a single finger the notes to a Broadway tune or a contemporary song, as my grandfather used to do. At its most limited, a piece of furniture that projected the self-congratulatory gesture of a family that could afford to decorate its home with this heavy, immobile, immutable, and paradoxically, usually silent fixture, tune-like in its persistency. And so the pianos on the sidewalks are about the undoing of home. The discomforting realization of that death-like immobility that so many modern homes have come to be shown. Number two, the christening of the home with the piano has much to do with its development over two centuries, three centuries, which Martin has traced. He mentioned the first piano invented by Bartolomeo Cristofori in, in 1709, not so much different from today's piano. Last year when I was in Florence, I went on several occasions to concerts at the Accademia Cristofori, which is a society of musicians and music lovers who gather once or twice a month to hear performances on their collection of 18th century pianos. They're smaller instruments than our Steinways and even our uprights, made of light wood, and they have a smaller and more brilliant sound than the modern day piano. The, key, the keys are easier to press down. There's a kind of velocity that the Cristofori piano, like the harpsichord or today's organ, permits. There's less resistance and more give to these keys, less human labor in terms that Martin discusses. The big sound, the product of labor, comes later in the 19th century. Pianos with heavier wood, heavier keys, bigger hammers. Liszt, one of the great pianists of his time, was all about the virtuosity of sound rather than of speed, the virtuosity of power, like a Wagnerian opera. After hours of playing on a big piano, a Steinway Grand, your fingers ache. This is indeed work, the work that Liszt and Brahms embraced, or for that matter, Wagner, a Wagner who has Wotan tell him that a free man creates himself, and a creation uh, that is exemplified in those massive transcriptions for piano, churned out by Brahms and Liszt, among others, that made the piano not the single voice of the slight Christophe de piano, 
felt the multiple voices of an orchestra hammered out in the percussive, titanic, energetic gestures of the concert pianist. This is the global or encyclopedic piano that, as Martin has beautifully said, encompasses the 12-hour day, the pattern of the seven long and five short months that govern annual time, a piano that embodies the totality of the life process itself, nowhere more elegiacally but triumphantly affirmed in the documentary that maybe some of you have seen called Note by Note, the making of Steinway L1037, which follows the construction of the Steinway Grand Piano from its birth in an Alaskan forest to its exhibition in the Steinway Showroom at Columbus Circle in New York City. This is a wonderful movie that came out in 2007. If you haven't seen it, do. Number three, the electronic keyboard returns us to the light touch, the lack of resistance of the early pianos. While its MIDI software and computer capabilities also do so much more, dissociating touch from sound, and so creating that effect of magnetic incongruence that Martin describes. That disconnect behind eye and ear, between eye and ear, is what I experienced when my son, late into the night, composes onto his keyboard, his headphones on. I hear the tapping of his fingers, pushing harder than I think they need to into the plastic box of the keyboard, but I don't hear the sounds that are being recorded into the electronic loop, transformed into digital code. Marked onto the computer screen, he watches in a darkened room as pinpoints of little green lights emerge against a background that is not quite a staff. I'm missing the vital link, the sound itself. I hear only what produces the sound, the fingers' percussive motions drumming onto the keys, and I see the flashes of light that reveal the synthesizer's own restless and responsive energy. When my son invites me to wear the headphones to hear his composition, there's, near, there's no longer any clear sound of finger on key. But nor is there a noticeable A or A flat that you can isolate as a single tone. What the piano gives, distinctiveness and clarity of sound, is here disembodied, extracted from its origin, the labor of the hand on the key. In the supposed immediacy and instantaneity of a postmodern age, the process I have just witnessed betrays any such immediacy. It's all about mediation, recursive looping, and interventions, refracted and recycled sound. The hand on the key of a Steinway or a Christophany piano was much more immediate in its effect, even though that immediacy is belonging to the process. The key on the piano raises the ribbon, which forces up the jack against the hammer roller and lifts the lever carrying the hammer, which strikes the wire to force its vibrations into the wooden box from whence those vibrations will emerge like voices from a tune. This is a description I actually got from the great book called The Way Things Work by David Macaulay. And what's great about these two pages where he talks about how piano works is that on that same page, he has a little paragraph about how the manual typewriter, the monkey that does good but it works as well. So it's a great <laughs> footnote to you. Uh, like the dubbing of voices in foreign films, there is even here a disjuncture between the eye and the ear, however slight, as accentuated in Martin's <coughs> And finally, number four, and this is where I could have the first photo of Martin. That would be great. For the ninth installation of the performance exhibition series at MoMA in fall 2010, the artist Jennifer Alora and Guillermo Casadilla presented a show called Stop, Repair, Prepare, Variations on Ode to Joy for a Prepared Piano. For this piece, the artist cut a hole in the center of a grand piano, through which a pianist played repeatedly, basically every half hour of the day in a gallery on the fifth floor of MoMA, the famous fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the, you know, the Ode to Joy. The performer would lean over the keyboard and play upside down, backwards, so not unlike what we just saw in the bottom half of Martin's film. Um, and this is a tech, you know, technically it was an incredible feat, and one which, is, which was enhanced by an equally incredible feat. While playing, the performer moved, used his body to move the piano slowly, cumbersomely, through the vast atrium, while the museum's visitors followed him around. This is where that second uh, picture uh, shows the visitors, I mean, this is where I went up to the floor above and looked down and said, this is kind of what you got. Um, the guy, you know, you can't really even see him, you can see his hands, and this was the, the swarm of visitors that slowly, you know, in this kind of semicircle, kind of followed the piano. They were, to use a word from Martin's talk, mesmerized. How could this piano man, for such he had become, do so much to reshape and redefine the work of the piano? The listing from the exhibit in a little booklet that you got when you saw the show focuses on what happens to the ode itself in this performance. As the artists claim, quote, the result is a structurally incomplete version of Beethoven's ode, 
the hole in the piano that there's two octaves in operative that underlines the contradictions and ambiguities of the song that has long been invoked as a symbol of humanist values and national pride. But as I stood in the Romans gallery, I was watching more than listening, I have to confess. And if Martin talked earlier about the union between Pasiphae and the wooden cow that produced the Minotaur, I was reminded here of another similar monster, and we've been talking about monsters today, in this case the centaur, man and horse. Even as this slow amble of the piano across the room is exactly that of animal and prosthesis. In this case, it's half man, half piano. And the man is not free, hardly the Wagnerian free man who creates itself, but one entrapped within and by the piano's tune, even as he must disfigure it. So the free flow of sound, the dance of the hand across the keys, the resulting aesthetic, is weighted down and compromised by labor. Thus does Beethoven falter in his reconceptualization of soundboard as well as sound, the template here punctured in the attempts to accentuate an unnecessary exertion of affective human labor, again using these terms. At the same time, the piano has legs. The soundboard is destroyed, but the instrument has become mobile. It can travel, even if only around in a circle. Is this an escape from the archetype or from a relentless insistence on its materiality? Who is parasite here and who is host? Where does the human reside in this centaur? As the performer falteringly, haltingly plays from the inhuman position of the ghost from the machine, the shadow of the pianist's head that occasionally darkens the keyboard in Martin's film, the Christ resurrected from his tomb, uh, the monster. Uh, Martin, thank you for your talk. Inserting the human body a little bit into um, this, this is my response. And it's more a set of provocations around the piano. I'm a pianist, so um, I started thinking about this when I got the notes from Martin's talk. Though I have not witnessed typewriter opera. So at a distance and with that handicap, that faltering, to use the language of this conference, I only have Martin Surgeon's account of an audiovisual object that under his careful analytics is nonetheless rendered in a later flow of words, terms, and phrases. The textual depiction of an object I take to be a temporally displacing and digitally parasitic offering, tasked with, as he aptly describes, typewriter opera's concerns with the status of the piano as an ontological object. I want to pursue this pianoforte to give it its full naming, falteringly, hesitantly, this instrument of reified rationalized soundingness. In its ordering and measuring of sound into its equal tempered sound world, it disqualifies entire worlds of soundings. The equal tempered displacing and relocating the microtonal to the now irrational soundings of the non tempered. Even the super temporal, if one hears the Indonesian gamelan or the almost infinitely retunable Japanese koto as corollary of ancient and distant cousins to our Italian pianoforte. Indeed, in its full naming, the pianoforte grounds itself not simply in the equal tempered scale, but in the dynamic range of its application. And if Tignoin's spinning zoetrope can be thought of as its ontological forebear, the typewriter opera can be said, as Professor Scherzinger so eloquently develops in his talk, to bear the marks of the pianoforte's hybrid origins as a newer media spun from the cloth of older ones. The frozen through time tells us of tonality. In writing my response prior to viewing the typewriter opera, I wonder if the pianists are allowed to play inside the piano, or is all the action, pun intended, taking place at the keyboard? Is the piano prepared a la Henry Cowell, who sought to emulate the larger pre-pianoforte sound world? Or John Cage, Cowell's one-time student, who looked to the Indonesian gamelan for inspiration in his, his exploration of the pianoforte's percussive nature? Would this alter the ontological <coughs> substance of a pianoforte performance given to the one-eyed gaze of the barely blinking camera? Why is a piano prepared rather than repaired in order to fill in the gaps its equal temperament excludes? In the limitations of thinking of the pianoforte as fully captured by hands on its keyboard, to what has typewriter opera been blind, or perhaps more accurately, rendered deaf or mute? What do the experiments of Cowell and his student Cage, a name that suggests more than mere capture, speak back to typewriter opera? 
It suggests, it seems to me, that the analog digerati of the piece begs a number of avenues left unexplored. The image given to me beforehand of the forehand suggests a certain type of racialized, gendered, and class pianist. What might typewriter opera tell us about a faltering humanities if there were gnarled, overworked hands at the keyboard? What about age? Would wrinkled, liver-spotted hands give us another way to see the music in typewriter opera? What might black or brown hands indicate about the ontological status of the piano forte? While Scherzinger touches on the Africanization of the piano and typewriter opera, I want to think of its possible Asianization. I've already mentioned Cowell and Cage, two composers and pianists who thought of the pianoforte as a possible Asianizable object. Indeed, with the overwhelming presence of Asians in the classical music world, to what sorts of inquiries and statements might those yellow hands motivate? How does typewriter opera fit into such a rendering, or can it? Is the piano universal enough to carry its ontological baggage into a soundly marked Asian that does not merely overlay a European sensibility onto Asian hands? In other words, does typewriter offer provide a way for the pianoforte to, to subvert the pianoforte's origins? Is the typewriter itself a non-translatable mirror object? Typists don't need their feet, for instance, to realize their instrument's potential. The focus on the digits of the hand, in other words, misses the fully embodied ontological thrust of the pianoforte, its spinning of the entire body of the instrumentalist and the realization of its sounding out. By tending to the gaze, which is restricted to the hands and the keys, typewriter opera obscures the full embodiment of the performers who realize the pianoforte's effective agency. I'd like to continue pursuing the extension of digits, short as your notes, by raising the specter of the pianist's feet. Where are the una corda, the sostenuto, and the damper pedals? A pianist's technique adjusts to the application of select pedals, or like a modern trap drummer, the hands, like a reverse marionette, are manipulated from below by the feet. Does typewriter opera, I wonder, face the feet? From Scherzinger's remarks, I take it that the feet disappear like the non-equal tempered soundings of another logic, another telos, another sound world. In thinking about the feet, I want to trace them back to the theme of this conference, the faltering humanities, and specifically today, the translation of those faltering humanities into, out of, and through other canons. So the feet. <coughs> what of those lower digits? As Frederick Chopin theorized, there are a number of pedal positions available that affect the sustain and timbre of a piano. Some scholars put this as high as 35 gradations of the sustain pedal alone. Debussy and Ravel not only provide robust theories of pedaling, but are also among the few composers who score the use of the somewhat misnamed sostenuto, or middle pedal. In any case, these forgotten feats certainly play an important role in piano performance. How might typewriter opera evoke these feats? How would it alter typewriter opera in terms of its concerns with the piano as an ontological object? Do feet matter? Again, not having seen typewriter opera, and only having a single image of its performance, and Scherzinger's description in which to base my provocations, I wonder about the rest of the body of pianistic motion. Should we assume a tuxedo performer, or can we also think of performers such as Awadigan Pratt, an African-American pianist, conductor, and violinist whose appearances on concert stages across the globe are not only remarkable for his virtuosic technical dexterity, but also for his dreadlocks, his denim overalls, and his bare feet. Yes, those feet again. He forces concert audiences to note his feet by uncovering them, by unmasking them, by liberating them from the dark socks and shoes of his peers. What do we make of Alice Sarah Ott's bare feet peeking beneath the long formal dresses she prefers for a pianoforte concertizing? Perhaps this is mere gimmickry, but perhaps this is slight commentary as well, a faltering at the pedals of the pianoforte's ontological stability. And what of the exuberant bodies of performers such as Long Long or Keith Jarrett? What of the wildly rhetorical gestures of the romantic pianists such as Arthur Rubinstein or Vladimir Horowitz? Speaking of Jarrett, what of the accompanying vocalizations he is infamous for issuing as he performs? He is certainly not alone in this either. Pianofortists from Yubi Blake to Glenn Gould hum, mumble, sing, and otherwise vocalize their, through their performances, both improvised and notated. In bringing up the subject of improvisation, I want to conclude with the final set of provocations. How might typewriter opera be transformed by improvising digits versus digits faithfully following the dictates of a written score? How might stride jazz, ragtime, or Little Richard's flamboyant rock and roll affect a piano's ontological status? Little Richard reminds me of Feet again and the creative misuse of African-American music in which he participates. 
What happens when Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis bring their feet up to the keyboard? How would this affect one's reading of typewriter opera's concerns with the pianoforte as an ontological object? In recalling Schertinger's Africanizing, what of the Imbira or Matepe, or the piano, with its own transformations as the African group Ponono No. 1 demonstrate with their engagement of electronics? Again, unlike the image we have seen today, how might black hands change this nexus of visibility and audio abilities? Schertinger refers to the hocketing of a typical Matepe performance, the sharing of melodic material between multiple musicians and their instruments, a kind of ventriloquism, as the athlete describes that gives the music a present non-presence, a something guessed at. In conclusion, I would like to circle back more explicitly to the notion I've been playing with all along in my provocations, my big lies, as it were. That is, Scherzinger's concluding evocation of the effect of human labor at work here. What do the hands conceal of that labor? What do the hidden feet reveal? And what might the grain of the pianoforte sound out due to that effect of human labor that illuminates, however falteringly, our own sense of the humanities in a profoundly digital moment. Any questions? that uh, both Jane and uh, Kevin, uh, you know, spoke a lot about labor, and I somehow just sort of chopped it off, like the body itself, from my paper, because I thought I was running out of time, but it, you know, I wasn't, actually. But um, I should just uh, mention what I said about labor so that this contextualizes some of these remarks, and that is that uh, the way in which, uh, or that the, the history of coded templates as they, as they intersect with affective human labor is probably the question of our times. Okay? How coded templates intersect with the human body. Um, and opus, this is where the word opera comes from. I mean, opus, uh, in, in a, in, in, uh, as in a musical opus, is uh, you know, the singular for opera. Um, and so that was very handy for me to use that word as a typewriter opera. It's both the human labor and the template. The typewriter was the template. Uh, the labor is the hand. Um, and uh, it's the same word for work. And of course, I read Italian autonomists all the time. I was very happy that they too are called operaists because is not the figure of the labor today, does it not coincide precisely with the maneuvers of the virtuosic performer? In other words, labor today is precisely sort of coincident with a certain kind of virtuosic performer that is uploaded onto a kind of interface, which has its specific design. So big, uh, big data infrastructures today that are layered in parallel with um, a social layer have enabled new modes of aggregation um, and parasitic capture. Right? So we can sort of turn the figure of the parasite around today. If traditionally the host was besieged by a multitude of microbes, Today, we can speak of the multitude as curiously besieged by the host. Um, uh, in other words, incrementally ordered parallel spaces or parasites are threatening to transform by repetition into parasites. And I'm looking here, I'm thinking about big data uh, infrastructure and the way in which uh, pianism is our mode of labor today. Now, the question about, um, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm just going to try and engage some of the critique because there's tons of it, and so I'll just engage a few of it, but maybe some of it sort of spills over into, into other aspects of it, um, about the sort of reification and the rationalization that is at work in the piano. This is quite uh, visibly what is at stake, and I say visibly because the visual work of the film does more to emphasize this than the sound, which is seduced by it. Uh, that uh, that uh, reified character of the, uh, the components that comprise this, this digital interface are precisely what is at stake. Um, and it's remarkable afterlife and sublimate, not even that sublimate, but video, invisibilized afterlife, right? And this is the way the capacious quality of code that has now become a world monopoly in a way that is not as visible when you make vivid the interaction between the labor and the template and estrange it more or less by turning it there. You know, in fact, the, you know, the, the Met uh, production, Start, Prepare. prepare. Uh, what would have fascinated me is the difficulty of playing something upside down, which coincidentally, like with African instruments, the upside down, right side up thing is much more, uh, much more interesting and differently construed. So the question of um, whether we, you know, Carl Cage and all of these people, this is the 20th century. I, mean, I was dabbling in the high life of the piano. 
um, high life is going to be another concept I wouldn't mind bringing back. African high life has a lot to do with the way beat tracking works and software and so on. But um, playing inside the piano, a la cage, cow, and so on, um, altering it, faltering it, and this kind of thing. This is more or less what was at stake in the previous um, session, which is that uh, if we alter and cast out and falter and so on, maybe we illuminate something. I was trying not to do that. I was trying to let the piano be, in a sense, a sort of at its essential, in, I was trying to locate it in its essential um, uh, kind of character. Um, the more, the better to illuminate some of its ontological presuppositions. Um, then, so, so that's uh, why I chose to work with that. And the 20th century has been undoing this for a long time. Well, did it work? We can't prepare MIDI, right? We can't do, or most people cannot do that anymore. We don't have that kind of access. So it's, it's in some sense much more of a, a powerful ghost now that we must reckon with, right? And the, the politics of software, which is, which is what this bigger project is about, is, is, is more or less where this is leading. So it's a little bit of a, a small fragment of work. Uh, we, uh, Colin and I have been working with hands and severed hands. So the disembodiment is in some sense a severing that in the context of Africa makes, um, uh, has, 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 has you, you know, uh, uncanny and disturbing resonance. Um, and we're also following the way, you know, clapping patterns from the Congo and so on have uh, migrated across into, um, uh, and from the Congo into, you know, uh, iconic Western pieces like clapping music, for example, and uh, the, the, the way in which that uh, is involved with uh, the politics of copyright or the poetics of copyright, which make, put, put Africa always already into the public domain and so on and so forth, and uh, thus uh, free of the economies of exchange, it moves into the West and suddenly it, uh, you know, it has this privilege of moving in a different kind of economy. And we, you know, we, so we're looking at hands, severed hands in the context of slavery, same region, the Congo. This is the sort of you know, 20th century version of severing hands and how do you clap with one hand and so on. So we're really interesting in this, they're interested in this image of disembodiment, but more to actually conjure the full body, right? How much of the body is useful for capital? How much of the body is useful uh, in the context of a particular digital interface? So that was why that moved. So if, we, uh, if we've had too many dreadlocks and faces and so on, we would in some sense, um, it, would, it would move into a different artistic direction and the dialectic would have a different character. Um, so I think you're in fact having just the hands in gold office. And then if I had seen those two bodies, perhaps I would think of them as rich uh, response. I saw the head around it. I mean, I'd, like the, I'd love the play of shadows on the yeah, yeah. Right, so that was the platonic object casting shadows back onto yeah. this platonic object. So that the human is in some sense reinserted, but as a severed human, but, but in some ways, yeah, it, it does do it by negating it and cutting it, but it would be like a slicing it. Really. Yeah, and in fact, as you're, you're talking now and speaking of uh, the data and software and all of that, uh, it reminds me of Colin Moncaro's uh, uh, player piano pieces, right? Where he, he effectively gets rid of the human by right? like, like, um, having piano rolls that are just no human and can play them, right? Or perform them. And so he's effectively doing a, a different sort of work that your typewriter offers to, right? Mm -hmm. But in a way that's engaging rather than it's firm. Yeah, I mean, you need yeah, six and seven and so on fingers to play yeah, yeah. Uh, Nankara. Schoenberg said, well, you know, they, they can't play his music, but wait, uh, you know, we need six fingers, they'll come. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're moving toward the horse, we're moving toward two fingers, according to the evolution of the biologist, but, you know, and the horse. Is, the horse has been a big image that came up, and we've been staring at this uh, uh, object for a long time. It is a horse. I mean, it, you know, the images from above, and the stallion-like character, and even the shape, and we found all sorts of things, and, you know, there's a sculpture that uh, we're going to make, uh, just cutting off the side of the, which looks exactly like an African baboon mask, and so on. Uh, but one very brief point before talking about the politics of software again, and that is the difference between the faltering and altering kind of aesthetic, which seems to characterize a lot of the humanities and the arts as such, sort of deconstruction or doubt and so on. But I think, uh, uh, one, I don't think that's what we're trying to do. In fact, by bringing in a different template, uh, which is organizes and comports the body and the body techniques and so on. I mean, I played my tape and video before I actually got to the piano. So the piano was the weird instrument at first. But the way it comports the body, the way it emphasizes different, you know, the asymmetry, uh, the psychology of asymmetry with the left hand, left arm and so on. The, it, it trains the body in such different techniques to comport the body differently. So it's very concerning when an instrument with a particular kind of uh, comportment 
then becomes eternalized in a much more invisible way. Right? And this is not only happening with piano and digital uh, and MIDI and so on. MIDI was overcome more or less by, uh, by, by 1987, but nobody took it up, so it was locked in like, you know, QWERTY. It's, you know, they made a design, but they locked in and they would sit with it. Um, but, you know, the, the politics of beat tracking software, for example, um, are, are something I'm looking at now, which is heavily funded by Google and, and others, uh, about how the human entrains uh, the body toward uh, musical inputs. And they want to do this for all sorts of reasons, very powerful applications. And the eurogenetic bias of that particular um, a data set that they're working with is, is staggering. And the cognitive psychology yes. that associate that, you know, people like Leado and Jack, no, yeah. uh, uh, your colleague, uh, at, at this was a very foundational text, also written in 1983, the same time that he's invented and so on. Exactly. And the, the, the way in which beat tracking works for the human body is now going to become immortalized in a very seductive kind of uh, software, which makes the machine feel more animate and human, and nobody's going to reject it back in, uh, in Zimbabwe, right? But it's going to be, uh, its reference point for how the body comports to sound is very, very narrow. And the matepe, by the way, I used it uh, deliberately because it's an instrument that is disappearing. There is no matepe playing tradition in the world today. We, we were faced with extinction on the one hand and immortalization. I have time for one or two questions, and hopefully we can continue this discussion. <coughs> uh, anybody? Oh, well, Kevin. <laughs> if, okay. Well, I was just wondering what might happen. Go ahead. Well, denying the interaction of what was there before seems not quite right, so I've been trying to figure out what the difference might be. So I was just curious to hear more about those, the distinctions. Yeah, no, and again, I mean, this is really bringing myself in only as, as an observer to a process I myself have no knowledge of. Um, so as the observer, you know, watching someone, um, and it, it, it does seem to be like typing. That's interesting to me, too, about, about some of the MIDI programs, that it does mean that bodily engagement as a result of the camera, it's just the hands. Hence the eye, because the eye is tracking the sights on the screen as the sound is going into the keyboard. I mean, what then happens in terms of the electronic programs my son uses, because he's into, among other things, EDM, electronic dance music, is that the sound then becomes distorted, so that the final product of what he's doing over you know, hours and days is, as I was just suggesting, a sound that is, that is infinitely distant from the initial, for me as observer, sound Part of the keyboard experience, you know, playing on a, an actual piano, you know, whether it's a Steiner, maybe right or an upright, is that you know you have much closer approximation <coughs> of the flavor of the finger and the product, and the product of sound. Even though, as I read that little snippet from how these things work, it's an incredibly mediated process too. Um, but for me, again, as the observer mom, um, there is the sense of this process of mediation that <coughs> distances almost infinitely from me. Um, the actual gesture of making the noise. Seems to me to utterly divorce the rest of the body from the hand. I mean, that's where I think your comments on pedals were really, was really quite apt. Yeah. In, in, in the electronic 